Thanks, everybody. Who else has a, uh, uh, a bit of a meat coma today? <laughs> Anyways, uh, so this is load testing Kubernetes. And uh, I'm going to go through how to optimize your cluster uh, resource allocation in production. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Harrison. And I'm a senior software engineer at Buffer. And I focus on um, helping our product teams get more stuff done and also some of the architecture work um, for, for our system. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a case study. So we had a pre-existing endpoint in our monolith. Um, it was done in PHP. And it serves the number of times a link has been shared within our product buffer. So um, Buffer is a social media tool, and people like to share uh, tweets. They'll, they'll queue up a bunch of tweets, and sometimes those tweets would contain a link. Uh, so we keep track of the number of times those things have been shared. And then uh, bloggers will have uh, the Buffer button displayed. Um, so we serve a button that shares, shows a count so uh, people can get an idea of how many times their link has been shared um, so they can gauge interest in what they're, they're writing about. So we settled upon a, a simple design, um, or so we thought, using uh, Node and DynamoDB to, to back the counts. And we deployed the service to Kubernetes. And it had four replicas. And uh, we manually verified uh, using curl that this, the service was operational. So we, we were running pretty much stock Kubernetes um, using uh, the stock uh, services and were deployed on AWS. So we route 1% of our traffic from our existing application onto our Kubernetes cluster. Things look fantastic. So we, we scaled that up to 10% uh, of all the traffic was being routed into uh, our new setup. And then we moved up, as you'd expect, to 50%. <laughs> and this is where things started to get interesting. Um, so the first thing that we did was uh, kind of freaked out and scaled up our replicas 5x. So we scaled it up to 20 pods. Um, this helped, but the pods just, they just kept dying. And it, it, it wasn't clear, because we were really new to Kubernetes at the time, what was going on. So then we scaled the traffic back down to 0% and uh, spent some time investigating uh, what, could, what could be happening. So um, the first thing was I, I had copied and pasted a deployment from another service. I, and I think it was just something that I found on, on, on the internet. And uh, shame on me. But the, uh, the deployment included resource limits. And they weren't the right resource limits for, for the application and the load that we were doing. Um, with a little more investigation, we found that we were uh, getting OOM killed, which basically means that the container ran out of uh, uh, memory, and Kubernetes had um, basically killed it. So let's talk a little bit about resource limits. So these are constraints that can be set on both CPU and memory utilization. And uh, without these things set at all, uh, the containers can run unbounded with the CPU and memory that they consume. Um, there are some things in place now, uh, defaults that you can place on name, namespaces, um, but I'm not going to cover that in this talk. Um, but they are available. So uh, Kubernetes, will, so w when these thresholds are crossed, um, so when a limit's crossed, Kubernetes is going to restart the containers. So how do we go about optimally setting these things? So it's important to understand what optimal means here. And that means that each pod has enough resources to complete their task. And this also means that individual nodes can run the maximum number of pods. So there's uh, different ways that things could, things could go wrong and also things could go right. Um, so the first one is under allocation which is what we were experiencing in our case. This is where you don't, your, your limits aren't high enough so that when you, you apply the load that you're getting from your traffic, um, Kubernetes just causes this thing to, to crash because you, you haven't given it enough memory or maybe it ran out of CPU. Another one is over allocation. 
And this is where you set the limits too high. This, um, this is a trickier problem to, to spot because uh, things aren't going to break in a very obvious way. And it really becomes a problem when you start to scale up replicas. Because you could imagine, let's say you, you um, waste 10 meg of memory for every replica. You scale that up to 1,000. You've, you've made your problem 1,000 times worse. And this, this could be, mean all the difference between running more, more, more pods on your nodes. In, in this case, you, you'd be running an extra pod um, if you had set your constraints uh, appropriately. Um, even allocation. So this is, um, this is something that you should strive for. This would be a perfect allocation. You're 100%, you, you're utilizing 100% of your resources and, and, you're, and you're saving, your cost savings is maximized. Um, this is something that you should work towards, but um, again, this is one of those, uh, good enough is, is, is probably good enough and striving for perfect might not be great in your, uh, in your use case. So the next thing to think about is the way that Kubernetes does monitoring. So um, this is kind of to highlight the, the system as a whole. I'm going to go through um, wh what this looks like on an individual node. But it's important to note that there's multiple nodes. There's a master. And there's also this storage backend that connects to this thing called Heapster. So the very first layer is uh, C Advisor. And this runs on each of the nodes. And what its responsibility is, is to collect uh, metrics for each of the pods that are running um, from Docker. And it collects metrics like CPU, uh, memory. It collects information on the file system. Um, and there's some other things that, uh, that it does as well. Um, but the important thing here is now, with that information, the kubelet makes decisions on what to do with pods based off of what C Advisor tells it. So then from there, um, something that you can, it's an add-on, um, but if you add Heapster onto your cluster, it's going to aggregate all of the metrics from the kubelets, um, and also uh, has different backends for storage. The default is uh, something called InfluxDB, and um, Heapster allows you to visualize what's going on at the cluster level. So when you're setting limits, um, and this is, this is Buffer's approach, uh, it's, we're trying to understand just what one, one pod can handle, so one replica. And we start with a conservative set of limits. And then uh, we'll run some tests, and I'll talk about what type of tests those are. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll adjust those limits until we find, um, find the, the, the limits that work for us. And we're only gonna change one thing at a time and observe the changes. Um, that way you don't have too many variables. So there's a couple of different type of testing strategies that we employ. So the first one is uh, where we slowly ramp up the traffic. We start from no traffic, and we slowly increase it until we find this point where it breaks. Um, and then once we find the point where it breaks, uh, we're going to run um, something called a duration test. And we're going to run that test just under the breaking point. Um, and at this point, we're going to be looking for things like memory leaks, um, maybe uh, unpredictable, uh, maybe there's, there's a queue that gets filled up. There, it depends on what you're building, but um, every, everything kind of has different modes. So uh, I'm going to do a live demo here. So, all right. And I'm going to set limits on etcd. And this is a tool that we've got open source called kubescope. Um, I did this demo last year, and to get this metric or to get all this information before I had to uh, use port forwarding and get um, the information from C Advisor directly. This tool gives you a little more information, um, and so you can see here that um, I've got CPU. This red line is what the what the limits currently set, and the blue line um, is what the current utilization of the container. So. Um, you can see that I've got 25M of CPU, and that's approximately 25 one thousandths of a CPU core, um, and also uh, 5 meg of memory. So I'm going to apply some load. And we use a tool called Loader.io. 
And before I get into this, um, etcd doesn't really have a way to, so Loader.io needs a token. If you do decide to do this, um, we've got a, um, let me increase the font here. Can everybody see that? Cool. Um, coming into our cluster, we have an Nginx server that's sitting in front of etcd. And that just allows us to serve our, our loader tokens we can authenticate uh, with loader.io in order to uh, run these load tests. So I'm going to run this test. And what we should see here is that um, you can already see that the memory utilization was pretty close. So, uh, <laughs> container has died. It's exactly what I'm expecting here. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't quick enough, but uh, what, what ended up happening there, so if I describe the pod, oh no. <laughs> And I take a look at the, um, where is it? The last state. So uh, you can see the last terminated state here. And you can see that the reason was that we actually got OOM killed. So we, we can see that the memory, uh, we, we ran out of memory in this case. So the, the next thing that we'll do is we'll, we'll edit the deployment, and we're going to increase the memory here. Um, I'm going to set up something so we can just watch. And you can also see that the etcd container uh, was restarted here, too. That's another indication that something went wrong. Um, so I'm going to edit the deployment. And at this stage, I'm making macro adjustments. So I'm going to increase this by a factor of 10. Um, oops. So we should see that re uh, container get restarted. the containers creating. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to find, OK, we've got the new etcd that's up and running. You can see that uh, before this was 5, now this is set to 50. and. Um, now when we rerun this test, we should see that we've got um, much more room to breathe there. And instead of just crashing immediately, uh, this test is going to complete. And um, you can see here, so this green line is the amount of traffic that's being sent over through loader. And you can see that we've got a spike here in the CPU. Um, and the blue line is the response time. So you can see as the response time, um, or as the requests, the number of requests simultaneously increases, so does the uh, request time with this case. That, that means we've probably got another bottleneck here. And um, with Kubescope here, you can tell that we are hitting, we're definitely hitting a CPU bottleneck. Um, so that'll be the next thing that we go and adjust. Um, so again, and uh, after this test completes here, I'm, I'm going to increase the uh, CPU by a factor of 10 and see what happens. So I'm going to set this to roughly a quarter of a CPU core. And 
I'm expecting this to break here, but uh, I've got a really, really small cluster here with one node um, and, and one CPU core. So um, if I describe that pod again, you can see that um, in the events log, the default scheduler is telling us that uh, we failed to schedule. And you can see that it doesn't have enough CPU. So um, I've hit one of my natural limits with my system, so I need, no, I need to, I can't quite give it 250, but um, I'd, I'd, I'd probably go back a little bit and I'd, I'd edit the deployment again um, to something more reasonable for this system. So I was at 25, uh, let's do 50. Okay, that's terminating. And while that's starting up, um, let's just take a look at the response time here. So we're looking at something like one second response times. And well, that's, that's not great, but uh, we should ex expect that if we actually are fixing our bottleneck that the response times is, are gonna go down. And since we gave um, roughly twice the resources for CPU, and if that's actually the bottleneck, we'd expect that to increase somewhat linearly, um, it's not gonna be perfect, and, and it really depends on the system. Um, okay, that's back up and running. I'm gonna run another load test, so remember about a second. Let me go back and visualize this while this is going on too. You can see that CPU is creeping up again. And if I were to compare this uh, side by side with the other response times, I would expect, yeah, we're still creeping up because we've hit our bottleneck, uh, but we're not creeping up quite as much. Um, if all goes well, we should see an average right around five to 600 milliseconds on the request. But if, if, uh, if I had more resources, I could keep doing this process over and over again until I hit this point where, um, I, I'm, where the CPU isn't, isn't pegged. Um, and wherever, the, wherever that, that, that setting is, you, you kind of find this maximum, um, this maximum amount of traffic that one container can handle. And once you've hit that maximum amount of traffic, the next thing you'll do is you'll run um, a duration test. And I'm just gonna run an example duration test here. But um, you'll run just under that breaking point for an extended period of time. And uh, again, what you're looking for are things like memory leaks, uh, queues being filled, uh, variance in response times are, are indications of, of these sorts of things too. Uh, a, a lot of interesting stuff can happen um, at this stage too. Uh, and and while, while you're doing these sorts of tests, instead of modifying things by a factor of 10, you're, you're, you're making smaller adjustments at this point. Um, you, you wouldn't necessarily want to increase things by a factor of 10 unless you had a really good reason to do it. And again, you might want to go back to your ramp up test when you do this sort of thing. Um, so I'm gonna jump back in. So while you're doing this, uh, it's important to keep a fail log, and uh, that's something that you're gonna wanna share with the team. This is um, both qualitative and quantitative information about uh, how the thing broke. Uh, and this is gonna be really important when um, you're making your, your run books because some, you're, you're not always going to be on call. Um, somebody else can look at, at, your, at your fail log and say, okay, we know that this thing is failing in, in an expected way. I probably just need to scale up. But if it's failing in an unexpected way, um, first off, you wanna update the fail log to, to, to make sure that other people know that this is a, a particular failure mode, but you might wanna start looking at other things. Um, it could be an issue with the code. Um, it could be another issue with the infrastructure with the related service. Um, but you, it, it's good to keep track of those things so you can understand that. So there's, there's different failure modes that you can observe. Um, one of them is where you've got a memory leak and, and memory is slowly increasing. And then you end up with that 
um, you end up with that sawtooth pattern. Uh, that, that's, that's familiar. Uh, another one is the CPU is pegged at 100% even after you're running your load tests. Um, sometimes this will this will happen. Um, maybe a queue's filled up, or maybe there's some process that just got hung. Another another classic one is you just see a bunch of 500s. You see high response times, uh, and, and a, a stranger one is a, a large variance in response times. Um, that one can happen with queuing. And then the last one is just requests. Just they just get dropped, and you never get a response. So some of the stuff that we learned through this process was that um, scaling up your replicas isn't going to solve uh, scaling issues for stateless. It's not always going to solve scaling issues for stateless or, uh, services. And um, we also learned that there's a lot of different ways that applications can fail. And um, keeping a fail log is actually a really good practice. It keeps, it keeps the teams closer together. Um, it gives something for systems and uh, developers, uh, d dev teams to talk about. So products, product can work closer. It's a communication point um, between product and systems. And really, it's about increasing the predictability of your system. If you're not setting limits on your containers, Unexpected things can happen. Um, things can take more resources than you expected. So just looking ahead at Kubernetes, um, the, all the tools that we have right now are a huge step forward for ops and cluster-wide um, operations. It's, uh, it, there's never been a better time to, to be an ops, ops person. But I think that there's still a huge opportunity for developers to get involved here. Um, and if, if SSH is, or if, uh, if kubectl is the new SSH, um, these tool, there's, there's some tools that we can build to help developers visualize what's going on and, and, and set, set things like limits. So that's, that's kind of why I built, uh, I hacked together kubescope. Um, I'm gonna be spending more time on this, and if it's something that anybody here is interested in, um, looking for pull requests, feedback, anything helps. Um, yeah, I'd like to open it up for any questions. And thanks, everybody. Yes. So I, I see how your approach is basically kind of run until it breaks and then back off. Do you have any thoughts for like a wider scaling, like maybe do half of what it is and just run more pods? How do you balance between bigger pods and fewer versus smaller pods and more? Um, so the question was, uh, stop me if I, if I don't quite get this right, is that um, how do you judge um, how to set the actual limits? Uh, once I know where the breaking point is, um, maybe I run more pods at half of the breaking point. I run twice as many pods. Is, is that? Um, so I think that kind of depends on, uh, on, your, on your business case here uh, for us. We want to run as few nodes as possible um, to keep costs down. And we're, we're running things pretty close to the breaking point at all times. And, and, and um, that, that keeps the cost down for us. If you have more capacity, uh, maybe you have more bursty data, it might make more sense um, to, to have twice as much capacity as you need, for instance. Yes. What was that called, pod? Okay, so the question was, am I familiar with pod vertical? Uh, sorry, what was that again? I'm, I'm not familiar with those, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with those. Yes. Did I have a replica set to three? Oh yeah, I, yeah, I had watch hooked up. Um, if there's three, that would have been weird. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
so that's one, uh, the question is, how, how do I know when I've gone too far? How do I know when I've given something too much? Uh, there's a couple of different ways that you can know that. The first one is that um, even though you're giving a pod more um, CPU, for instance, uh, that's one of the things that we kind of ran out of uh, resources because the cluster was small. But if you had more, uh, you could, uh, what you'll see is your, like, your, your requests will end up staying the same. Uh, you, you'll, you'll keep throwing more resources at it and your, your response times will end up being about the same as they were before. Yes. Yep. Yes. Um, so the question is, I, I might adjust that a little bit to be like, what if I write an app that is inherently performant, but its resource limits are extremely high? Um, that's a trickier one. Um, I think it. I, I kind. I think it kind of depends on, on on the individual case. Like I'm thinking of uh, compute heavy stuff, like. Um, I don't know, highly parallelizable tasks like machine learning might be an example of one of those things. Uh, I, I would start looking at like GPU acceleration in that case, but it, 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 I think it really depends on the individual app. If it can't be split up, uh, maybe it does actually need that much resources, and, and you're just kind of, it's kind of the state of, state of uh, what the world you live in. Yes. Um, so I, 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 I read that question as, have, A of all, have we automated this? And, um, if, oh, and also, could this be automated? Is that, okay. Um, we haven't automated this process yet. And uh, we have been looking in how to automate this. And the tricky part isn't actually running the tests. It's actually the starting point. And that, that, that requires some uh, domain knowledge about what language you're using, like Node versus Java containers are going to have a different starting point. Because um, I, I suppose you could just start from a really small number and slowly increase it. But like Loader.io, for instance, has an API that you can trigger things and kick off these tests. Um, you, you, could probably, uh, you could probably use that API and um, some tooling to adjust those, those limits. So you run a test, and if the the requests look okay. You can look at the mean and variance and the average requests and, and see how that changes versus, um, uh, see how that changes. You, you could probably automate this with, with the APIs. Yes, yeah, the starting, the, the starting point is the tricky part, I think. Yes. Uh, I don't quite follow what you're asking. 
Uh, ah, yeah, so the, uh, the question is, um, is there stuff that I could do before putting this out on Kubernetes? Could I instrument this locally uh, and, and, and make sure that my application is super performant? Um, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's the, the other side of this as well. Um, this is kind of like after you've got a container, um, after you've got a container and, and somebody, it, it, there's kind of that assumption there that, that uh, the app is relatively performant, um, th then you go and, and do this process. But it, it, would be, it would be very good to do that before starting this process. Okay, yes. So I think the question is, would you, would you run this in production? Um, well, long. So we actually run this in production along with the rest of all of our stuff. Um, and, and the reason why is uh, that crosstalk between services is something that we also want to observe. Um, so if this pod fails and causes other things to fail, uh, maybe like DNS is, um, is, is, is causing issues across the system, we'd actually want to know that before um, before uh, putting other traffic onto it. Yes? Do you have a service, do you have any experience with best practices? Do you have a service that has like accommodation of like reads and writes, do spend security, cheap security, yeah. so something where it's not immediately obvious that that's what it is, like it's just where it all comes together? Um, we, uh, so the question is do we have something that's got uh, more like non, non-trivial, um, like maybe it does a lot of reads and writes. Uh, maybe it makes a request to a third-party service. Um, maybe it hits a database on, in the same endpoint. Uh, so like maybe you've got a complicated endpoint that. Um, so we don't really do this on those, we we're, we're trying to avoid doing things like that um, because that, that's kind of our starting point. Like if you think of the, like our monolith is, is, really, is really that. Um, it's really difficult to, to load test that without putting users onto it. But it is, it's much easier to say focus on one of those endpoints, pull it out, and then load test that one endpoint. Um, which is kind of what, what got us on the microservices journey in the first place. Yes? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, we, uh, we actually don't test that. And you, I think you could use this. Um, you'd have to have the place that the ingress terminates to probably um, do something really, like a hello world app or something but um, yeah that would be that'd be cool to see what that looks like <laughs> thanks everybody <laughs>